talking about. So today, we're going to be on week three of a series called Faith. And we've defined what saving faith is the first week, and last, last week we looked uh, at Abraham's faith with his son Isaac. Today we're going to look at a story that has a lot of similarities to last week, and I want to talk about that just for a second, uh, because we'll see this story this morning involves a son, and the son's a parent, this time it's a mother. We're going to talk about the faith of one woman that changed really the, the course of a nation, which is pretty amazing. But what I wanted to touch on just briefly before we get into this, this specific story is this idea of themes in Scripture and why that is. And I've thought about that this week as I've looked at the sort of the outlay of this story compared to last week and how they, they do have a lot of things that line up. I'm like, okay, why does God do that? Isn't one story sufficient? Why does he have to repeat himself over and over? And there's two reasons that really I think that we see themes in Scripture or things repeated. First, it shows that God is always faithful. So it's not just a one-time thing where God came through for this one person and, and that was great, but it, he shows that he's faithful over and over and over again for different types of people, but in a similar way, in different times, but in a similar way. It shows that God is always faithful. He has a pretty good track record of faithfulness. He never fails. He's the only uh, being ever in the history of ever that's bad at a thousand. Uh, he's never sh he's struck out. He's never missed. He hits it out of the park every time. So the fact that we see themes, when you see themes in Scripture, think about that. It's because God's faithful. He's consistent. You can trust Him. The second reason is the opposite of that. It is that not only is God always faithful, but we see themes in Scripture many times because we are sometimes faithless. So we need reminders. We need to see a little tweak in a very similar story to say, okay, I see something different in this story than I did in that one. I see something different in this verse. It's almost word for word like this one here, but I see something different. We need that as frail human beings. We need that reminder over and over consistently that not only is God faithful, but he's faithful even when we are faithless. That when we don't feel like we have enough faith to believe God. We don't need that much. We'll talk about that a little bit next week. We don't need a ton. We just need enough to still believe. And God is that faithful and consistent that he still will do for us what he's done for people in Scripture. That he'll do for you what he's done maybe for your neighbor or your coworker or your family member. God is consistent and faithful even when we are faithless. So today we're going to look at the story of the faith of one woman. And She's not very significant herself. I mean, she's just an ordinary woman. But her faith really sets up the stage for the next, you know, several decades in the life of the nation of Israel. And it's pretty fascinating. So we're going to look at the story. It's in 1 Samuel. So if you have your Bible or you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can open that up to 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're going to read most of this chapter today and look at uh, the story of a woman named Hannah. So 1 Samuel chapter 1. We'll start at verse number 2. So it says, Elkanah had two wives. We're not going to get into that. Just go with me on that, okay? Uh, two wives, Hannah and Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah did not. Each year, Elkanah would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of Heaven's armies at the tabernacle. The priests of the Lord at that time were the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. On the days Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Penina and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would only give her one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. So Penina would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Year after year, it was the same. Penina would, haunt, would taunt and haunt yeah, uh, Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. So she's doing it behind his back, obviously. She's not like with him when he's present, you know, how children, she's like being a child. You know how children are. Why are you crying, Hannah? Why aren't you eating? Don't be downhearted just because you have no children. You have me. Isn't that better than having ten sons? He's pretty full of himself there, right? Yeah. But once, after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli, the priest, was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow, verse 11. O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime, and as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. 
So this is the kind of setting the stage for the rest of the story. And in these verses here, there's three things that, I, that we see here at the open uh, about faith and the faith of Hannah. First, we see her faith in the face of ridicule. Faith in the face of ridicule. So Hannah has no children. This other woman that she lives with, her sister wife, if you will, all right, uh, has children, plural, multiple children. And so this obviously causes an issue. And so in this culture, there are a couple cultural things we're going to look at today that aren't in the words, but they are in that, this culture. So in this ancient uh, Hebrew culture, children are seen as a blessing, right? So the more children, the better. Now, children, any of them, male or female, are a blessing, but the sons give you hope for a future. Because in this culture, women have no rights. They can't own property. They can't earn a living. They can't work. But they are dependent upon the men in their lives for survival. So a wife is dependent upon her husband for survival. And then if she becomes a widow, she better have some sons or else she's kind of on her own. She's out of luck. And so culturally, this is a big deal. So, and also culturally, what you see here and what you see actually written in the words here, the, the viewpoint of these ancient Hebrews is that God causes everything to happen. So the fact that she has no children is seen as either a judgment against her or something that God's withholding for a reason. And so that's how she's seen, which kind of gives uh, Penina, this other woman, sort of the ammo to, to mock her. Oh, God must not love you. You must have really messed up. You, something's off here because if, if you were holy like me, you'd have multiple children. And God would have blessed you with the son that you want so bad. So something's wrong. So she's in this ridicule here. Some of it is cultural. So she wants this son, and she's bullied about something that is out of her control. Like, how cruel is that? She can't help this. Like, she, it's not something that she has done, although spiritually it may have been seen that way. But she's bullied for something that she can't control. That's devastating to her. And she can't escape the ridicule. Where is she going to go? She can't leave the family. She can't kick out this other woman. She has no control here. So you would say, well, why can't she just leave? Why can't she just you know, tell her to shut up? Well, it doesn't work that way. She doesn't have that ability. She doesn't have that option. She's stuck in the spot she's stuck in and has really no option and no hope now and no hope for the future because she's going to keep aging and she's going to be past childbearing years and her hope's going to be gone. And so if, if she doesn't get a son, she's going to be dependent upon... Who? Maybe the relative of her husband? Maybe one of the sons of this other woman? That's not going to be good for her. She doesn't want to live like that. So she's faced this ridicule. And we face resistance, sometimes ridicule, in our life of faith as well. Let me give you a couple of, of sources of that. First, obviously, is Satan. He's a great source of ridicule. He's like numero uno when it comes to resistance in our lives. Jesus calls him the father of lies. He says the truth is not in him. It, Satan cannot tell the truth because the truth is not in him. Does that, does that make sense how deep that goes? It's not just that he lies, but Jesus says he is a liar, and that's all he can do because the truth is not in him, which is the total opposite of God, who is truth, and so all he can do is tell the truth, speak the truth, be the truth. So Satan comes against us all the time to oppress us. Scripture calls him the accuser. Day and night, he accuses us of things we may have done, maybe didn't do. Again, he's a liar, so that's all he does. So he comes against us constantly, consistently, on a regular basis to try to weaken our faith, try to make us break. He's a source of resistance in our lives. One source of resistance that may be in your life, maybe in my life, is you and me to ourselves. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy when it comes to our faith. Sometimes we just don't really have enough want to to want to anymore. And that comes from other sources, but we, again, have to determine, am I going to push through or not? Am I going to believe the lies or not? Am I going to act on these impulses or not? Am I going to believe what God says or not? It really is up to us and our own faith. We can't necessarily, there are other factors at play, but ultimately it's up to us. We can't blame any of those outside sources for our lack of faith. It's up to us. So we don't want to be our own worst enemy. What we see here in Hannah's story is that there were others in her life that were her source of resistance. And for her, it was severe ridicule. So sometimes there are people in your life that are very hostile to your faith. They're just like, this is so stupid, and you're so simple-minded, and you're so weak that you need this faith thing to get through life. I feel sorry for you. There might be some people that you know that are like that. They are openly hostile and resistant to your faith. 
They don't care how much it means to you. They don't care about your experience. They don't care about your belief. They don't care. They're just hostile to the idea of God in general, and so they just make fun of your faith. Maybe you've encountered that. Maybe, like Hannah, you have someone close to you that that's the case. Where you're like, you should know better than this. Like, you should see the genuineness of my faith. You should see that maybe the change from when you knew me before Christ to now, but they still don't. They just openly are hostile. And there are others that just maybe don't get it. They're not hostile to your faith, but they're just like, I don't, I don't understand. Like, I don't know how, and maybe it's because your life is in such a place. Like, I don't know how you can do this. And so they're not really support, they're not trying to push you down, but they're not supportive either. And really, they're probably a net negative in that case, because there's really no neutral in faith. You're either going forward or you're going backward. And so if they're not propelling you forward, then they're holding you back. Sometimes they're, it's innocent by nature, but still the ramifications can be pretty severe uh, for others in the face of that resistance. So the encouragement is, like Hannah, to keep the faith despite the resistance. Even if it is open hostility to your faith, push forward. Push through, because maybe you can't, like Hannah, you can't maybe completely kick them out of your life. You can't completely silence them. You're maybe a tough spot, but still, through faith, you can have trust in God, even in the face of ridicule. The second thing that we see here in these opening verses is we see that faith believes in God's goodness. And that seems like a self-evident statement, but it probably needs to be said. Because, in, again, in Hannah's culture, think about her position here. Culturally, she is seen as someone who has offended God to the point of barrenness. She, she probably even superimposed that on herself. She part of, part of her prayer every day is, God, what have I done? God, how can, I, how can you bless me? How can I be forgiven? How can, how can I make this right? What do I have to do? And so she probably beat herself up quite a bit because culturally she has this belief that God has caused barrenness to come upon her. But yet, verse 11, when she prays, it is, hey, God, I still believe you can do this. Right. Hey, God, I'm still coming to you for this. I'm not trying. You know, and there's really, she doesn't have any other options. They don't have fertility doctors, you know, 5,000 years ago. So she has one option. Either God's going to come through or nothing's going to change. So, but she doesn't harden her heart. Right? She doesn't, her prayer is not, okay, God, I'm done with you, and this is my last prayer, and we're through. You haven't, I've tried to be faithful, and I've tried to figure out, tried to live a holy life, and you've not kept her into the deal. She doesn't do that. She just says, hey, God, you're my only option. Yeah. You're my only hope, and so I, I need you to come through. She believes in the goodness of God. When we look at, really, the core definition of faith, we see that's part of it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says this, It is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists, duh, and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So we come to God in faith, knowing that he rewards those that seek him. And Jeremiah 29, verse 12, my favorite verse in the entire Bible, says the same thing. God says to his people, if you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. God wants to be found by us. It's not a game of hide and seek where he's like, oh, they'll never find me here. It's like, he's right there, arms wide open, ready to be revealed, ready to share life with you, ready to share blessings with, with you. It's just a matter of us having faith to believe that he is that good God. It's not, so we pray this prayer as kids, you know, God is great, God is good. A lot of times we get the greatness of God mixed, we think, oh, he's just great and he's distant, and he could do it, I don't know if he will. But it's both, God is great and God is good, yet... He has all ability and he has all desire to work in your life through faith. He has that desire. Believe in God's goodness. That's part of faith. The third thing we see here from these opening verses is a pretty important part of faith that I personally probably overlook and undervalue, and it's this. Faith can be specific. And I would go so far as to almost say faith should be specific. Okay, so Hannah prays for a son, right? Not just, God, would you help me know that I can become pregnant? Not just that you would give me a child, just generalize it out. God, I want a son. And again, we know culturally why. She's looking for uh, a future. She's looking for some hope here in the situation. She knows this is the only way. This is the only option, the only answer. And so God, uh, she's very specific with God. She was specific with her faith. 
Uh, there's a story of, of Jesus, too, in Mark chapter 10, where they're, well, I'll just, I'll just read the whole thing, because it kind of sets it up for you, okay? Mark 10, uh, starting at verse 46. This is about faith being specific, okay? So he and his disciples are walking, says, then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. That happens all the time. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, grandson of somebody else, I'm guessing, right, uh, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That's his initial cry for help. And then it goes on to say this, be quiet. Many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. Now, the next sentence of this story is fascinating. Here's the next part. He approaches Jesus, and Jesus says this. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. Isn't that self-evident? I'm blind. I'd rather not be. But it's not necessarily. Because it's possible he's making a good living begging as a blind man. It's possible that if he regains his sight, he's going to have to do a different job that he doesn't know how to do. It may earn him less money. He may be better well off financially if he stays blind. So Jesus is telling him, what do you really want? Why are you really stopping me in the middle of the street? I'm on my way somewhere else. What, what do you really want? Be specific. It's fascinating to think about that. So then he, he answers him. He says, my rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see and Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. Jesus asked him, what do you want? Be specific. Faith can be, I would say should be, specific. We see this elsewhere in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Paul writes this. He says, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let him know. Be specific. And again, I'll, I'll just be honest. I, I don't do this as often as I should. Sometimes my prayers may be too general. God bless this situation. Well, and God's probably like, what do you want? What are you just say it? Just spit it out. And he knows, doesn't he? He already knows the desires of my heart. He already knows what I'm thinking. He knows you know, the thoughts before I have them. And yet he's still probably like, Jesus, what do you want? Be specific. Because that requires faith, doesn't it? Amen. It's one thing to say, okay, God, would you do this if, if, it, if it's your will? And I'm guilty of that all the time. I hedge God's bets for him, okay? Don't, he doesn't need that. He doesn't need me to do that for him. He doesn't need my protection. He doesn't need me to get in front of him and say, well, I'm going to pray this as broadly as possible so God has a better chance of success. So I'm not praying for, I'm just, I'm pr praying is just simply, we talked about last week, speaking faith. So I'm not putting God in the corner. I'm saying, okay, God, do what only you can do. Right. And it's up to him then. I don't, he doesn't need my defense. He doesn't need me to protect him. So we can speak faith specifically. And really, Paul says we should. Let it be made known exactly what the need is. Because we believe, again, if we believe in God's goodness, we know that he's willing and able to do anything that we can ask or think, even above that, Scripture says. So faith can be specific and should be specific. Let's move on in the story and see what happens next. Pick up at verse number 12. So as Hannah was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her. Seeing her lips moving but hearing no sound, he thought she had been drinking. Must you come here drunk? He demanded, throw away your wine. So in a weird way, Eli at the beginning is more opposition, isn't he? Now he's doing the right thing and he has the right heart, but in a way he's another layer of opposition to Hannah. She's, maybe you've had this experience where... You, you're so in prayer, you're so desperate, you don't even have the words, and you're so in anguish, you can't even get anything out, and your heart is so broken over something, and, and you just don't, you can't even express it. That's what she's like. She is that desperate. And he thinks that she's been, mm, you know, and she comes to church that way, which, you know, if you want to come to church drunk here, great. We'll just, you know, God will do something for you, all right? So anyway, that's what I'm just saying. That's what, that's what, we're, that's what we're here for, right? So uh, that's what we're here for. Uh, so she says this, Oh no, sir, she replied, I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I am very discouraged. And I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I am a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. 
In that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. Now, she was specific in her prayer to God, right? But Eli doesn't hear what she's saying. He has no idea what her request is. And she's not specific to him. She doesn't tell him, I've been praying for this. She said, I'm just praying in anguish and in great sorrow. And I need God to help me. But she never told him what it was. And he says, okay, may God grant your request. And her response is, okay, great. This is great. She does what the next thing I want to mention today. Faith takes God at his word. Again, Eli, as far as we know, has no idea what she's praying about, what her request is. He doesn't know why she's in anguish. He has no idea what she's facing, what's going on in her life, in her situation. Yet he says, God will grant your request. And she just says, okay, if you're the guy that you say you are and you serve the God that, you, that he says he is, then great. And she just goes away ready to go, ready to believe God at his word. She doesn't question it. She doesn't have a conversation with him. She doesn't worry about it. She doesn't wonder about it. She, she just says, okay, God, you said it's going to happen. I, I believe you'll take you at your word. Another story that involves Jesus is in Matthew chapter 8, where a Roman a centurion comes to Jesus and says, hey, I've got a servant back at home who is really ill on the verge of death. I, I, I'm just coming to you because I've heard, you know, you can do stuff about this kind of stuff. Like nobody else can do it, but I, I've heard that you can and so Jesus says, yeah, I, you know, it's great. I'd love to. I'll just, you know, I'll follow you to your house, and we'll pray for him, and he'll be healed. But the centurion does something interesting. Here's what he says, Matthew 8, verse 8. Say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I, too, am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now, this is a Roman guard. He is not a Jewish believer in Jesus. He probably comes like Hannah did out of desperation. I've tried everything I can think of. I've done everything that I, I know to do. This is my only option I have left. I am so desperate that me as a Roman who believes in multiple gods, and I don't care about this little religion of Judaism at all, I'm going to go to this guy because I've heard that he can do stuff. Like, I've heard that he has some kind of power. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to go try to find out. He's my last resort. So he's not a believer. He's not Jewish. He doesn't believe in Jesus at all. But yet, Jesus says about this man, he says, I have never seen faith like this in all of Israel. So he's saying the people that should have this kind of faith don't. He has faith that's like to a different kind of degree. He just believes that if I say the word from whatever distance away we are, that his servant will be healed. And so Jesus says, like he did to the blind man in the other story, he says, go, your servant will be healed by the time you get back home. That's faith. This man believed Jesus had the power in just his word to heal his servant, and he was right. Amen. So you can have confidence in God's word. You can have confidence in God's promises for your life. Now, it may not happen when we want or how we want. We can believe God and take him at his word. And that's really why we, when we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus. Because his name has the only power that can do anything. So we pray in the name of Jesus because we invoke that power that comes with that name. That at that name, every knee bows, every tongue confesses that he is Lord. Like the demons tremble at his name. Stuff happens when Jesus is around. Things change when he gets involved. That's true in your life, in your relationships, in your situations. Anything that you face, when he gets involved, things happen. When he gets involved, things change. That's why we pray in his name. We trust in his name. We take God at his word. And again, that's the essence of the definition of faith. We see in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Those don't go together. Like you've, Assurance of things I hope for, that doesn't make any sense, but that's what faith does. Faith bridges that gap between hope and assurance. Faith bridges the gap between you know, things that I don't see to things that I want to see. It bridges that gap. Faith is that glue that holds that together. So here's what I would encourage us to do. God can be trusted, so trust Him. And it seems simple, and it seems like, yeah, but it's a good reminder. God can be trusted, so trust Him. Don't doubt Him. 
Don't disbelieve him. Don't say, well, I'm not sure. I have all these questions. Uh, there's a huge gap here, and I, I've been waiting for a long time, and I've tried so many things. God can be trusted, so trust him. Take him at his word. For any situation that you're in, that you're surrounded by, uh, whatever the opposition is, trust God because he can be trusted. Let's look at uh, the rest of the story here. Uh, skip down to verse number 19. It says this, The entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. Then they returned home to Ramah. When Elkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea, and in due time she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I asked the Lord for him. The name of Samuel means God hears. I, I named him Samuel because I asked for him, and God heard me. Let's get down to verse number 24. When the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh. They brought along a three-year-old bull for a sacrifice and a basket of flour and some wine. After sacrificing the bull, they brought the boy to Eli. Sir, do you remember me? Hannah asked. I am the very woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this boy, and he has granted my request. Now I am giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worship the Lord there. So the thing that we see here near the end of the story is that faith remembers and responds. Faith remembers and responds. Again, she prayed for a boy for a very specific reason, Yet, right off the bat, we haven't talked about this yet, right off the bat, she is going to sacrifice him. Not in the same way that Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac last week, different than that, okay? But she says, hey God, I'm praying for the only thing that I lack in my life, and as soon as you grant my request, I'm going to return him to you. Well, what's the benefit for her? There is none. She is that full of faith. God, if you do what cannot be done, I will do what I thought I would never do. Like, the only security I have, I'm going to risk it and give it back. The only hope for a future I have, I'm going to give him to you. I'm going to sacrifice everything if only you give that everything that I'm asking for. She's risking everything through faith. And what she's saying here, and what she does here is, God remembered me, so I'm going to remember God. So she says, I was desperate and God delivered. I was in need and God provided. I prayed, God heard and answered. God remembered me, now I'll remember him. God kept his promise, now I've got to do the hard thing, and I've got to keep mine. That's what Hannah does here. So we have the same option with our lives. Okay, We go back to the first week of the series. Faith is a gift. Saving faith, salvation is a gift. And it's free, right? It's a gift. And yet, once we receive that gift, it costs us everything. Just like Hannah. God gave me this miracle, now it's up to me to keep my end of the deal. So, it comes with our lives, because we say, Jesus, save me, and I will give my life to you. That's what Hannah did. Do we see the similarity here? It's not just God save me from my past, and my future is my own. It's not what faith is. Faith is, God save me from my past, and myself, and all this sin, all this stuff, and my future is now yours. I receive this gift of faith freely, but then it cost us everything. So our, our, the question with our life is, is have we kept, are we, are we keeping that promise that Hannah, like Hannah made? God, everything is yours. My words, my actions, my stuff, my relationships, my decisions, my future, none of it is mine now. I've given myself freely to you. You have complete control with my life. That's a big ask. That's a big promise to keep. And there are moments that we don't get it right, that we pull back this section of our life or this relationship from God or this decision. I'm going to make that one on my own. It's not easy to do. I mean, sacrificing everything to him is not easily done. But it's what's required. It's, it's about re God remembering and responding, which he does through faith in our lives, and then we remember what he's done and respond through faith by giving him our lives. Every aspect, every area, every little part belongs to him. That's the challenge of faith. Here's the last thing I want to mention as we, as we wrap it up today, uh, and that is this. One thing that we don't see in this story, but we do see in you know, the several chapters after this, is what I call the ripple effect of faith. The ripple effect of faith. So the story ends with Hannah. She gives up her only son that God gave to her, and she probably never sees him again. He's closed off. He is basically a priest in training. 
She can't have access to him. She probably never sees her son ever again. So for the rest of her life, she probably wonders, I wonder what ever happened to that son of mine. Like, I wonder what God ever did with that. I gave him everything. He better take care of him. Like, I, I did what I said I was going to do, and I hope it wasn't in vain. I hope it wasn't for nothing. She never, as far as we know, never sees the result of her faith. But there was a result of her faith. I mean, this book we're reading is called First Samuel. It's the same guy or it's the same boy that we're talking about in this story. Something pretty cool became of him. He became a judge over Israel. He became really what I would consider the first national prophet of Israel. He anointed the first two kings of Israel. This kid, this boy, this miracle did that. His mom died never knowing all that he would accomplish, all that he would become, all that he would do to set the trajectory for the future of the entire nation, yet her faith had a huge ripple effect. She never saw it. She never knew it. It was there. Wow. So here's the thing. Maybe in your life of faith, you haven't seen the result of your faith yet. Can this story just be an encouragement to you to hang on a little bit longer? Okay. Maybe you will. There are times where it takes a while and we do see some fruit or we do see a glimmer of something at the very end or we do, okay, there's, okay, that wasn't for nothing. So I would just say hang on to that promise. Hang on to that hope. Just because you haven't seen it yet doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Keep believing. That's what faith does. I'll take it one step further. Maybe you will never see the effect of your faith. But if your faith has been placed in God, it has not been wasted. Because if God always comes through, if he never fails, then we can believe that. We can bank on that. We can trust that. We can put our faith in that. By faith that you, you can know that you made some sort of impact. Maybe it's a person that you've invested hours and hours and years and years into, and you've just, you know, put your life into them, and you're not seeing any sort of spiritual growth in them, or they maybe have regressed, and you're like, well, is it all a waste? If your faith was placed in God, it's never wasted faith. If your hope is placed in God, it's never wasted hope. And let me just say one more thing as we close. and flip the script a little bit. So we've talked about ourselves from Hannah's point of view, but let's put ourselves in Samuel's point of view just for a second. Understand this, that you are a result of someone else's faith. As much as you are a Hannah and you should have faith and keep the faith despite resistance, despite all the things that come, despite the waiting, you are also a Samuel. You are the result of someone's faith. And you may not even know that. You may not know who was praying for you, or how long they did, or how long they still are, or how deeply they care about you, but you are a result of someone's faith. But here's the encouragement. Make the most of that person's faith. Make your life worth the faith that they invested in you. Make it worth their faith. May, may your life, may my life, continue to be more rippling in the water of faith. That it's not just going to end with me, but I'm going to pass it on through my life to others. That's what this whole faith thing is all about. It's not just that I'm a recipient of faith, but that I live my life out through faith to impact others by faith. Keep the ripple effect going. You are the result of faith. And you are a person of faith. And you can put your faith in God. It's never misplaced in Him. It's never wasted in Him. We can trust Him with 